Good morning, Glory. America. Bonjour. Hi, Canada. I'm Hugh Hewitt. Thank you for listening today. Whether you're listening way up north in Portland on WGAN 560 or FM 98.5 or way down in San Diego on 1170 KCBQ, thank you. We have a brand new affiliate, a brand new affiliate in Clovis, New Mexico. That's Cannon Air Force Base. Very, very pleased to welcome KCLV AM. 1240 Clovis, and yeah, it's about 100 miles from Amarillo. If you folks don't know, it's close to the border with Texas. Great affiliate, and thank you for bringing me, because you got a key, important Senate race. Nella Domenici needs to win down there, and you folks need to realize Martin, whatever his name is, does nothing for your state, and Nella will do a lot like her dad did, so get in the game and get out there and help Nella for Senate.com, I believe. She's been on before. She'll be back. Uh, we drove down, the Fetching Mr. Hewitt and I drove down to Portland proper last night. Took a while, but we wanted to see our old friend, Dr. Charles Norkey, professor of law over at the University of Maine Law School, and, and Mr. Arctic, and his wife is Mrs. Arctic, and we walked out feeling so dumb because she's a physicist. You know, you sit down and you have dinner with a physicist, and uh, I ordered Arctic char because, I mean, if you're going to go, Street & Company, by the way, fabulous restaurant in the middle of Portland. Fabulous restaurant. Street and Company, I recommend to anyone who's going to drive up from Boston or down from Midcoast, Maine, or on your way home from Maine, uh, just remember Street and Company. It was fabulous, but to my WGAN audience, give it, a, give it a try. Now, Clovis is important because of Nella. All of us are important. Whether you're watching on the Salem News Channel, listening to my affiliates across the country, getting closing in on that 500 number, want to make Gallagher green with envy. 500 radio affiliates, that's my goal. But, 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 but. More important than that, Donald Trump gave a speech yesterday, an important economic speech, and I doubt many of you heard anything about it. Now, Generalissimo is going to put most of it on his podcast today, Dwayne's World, so you can hear it all there, so go get Dwayne's World. Uh, I'm going to play some of it right now. now. I can't play all of it. It's a long speech, an important speech. The former president laid out the economic vision for Trump term two. Let's start with cut number 16. Donald Trump at the New York Economic Club, which is where people go to make economic policy. Cut number 16. Nearly two thirds of the jobs created under the Harris Biden administration were bounce back jobs. Bounce back. They were bounce back jobs that I handed them from before the pandemic. This happens with pandemics. You have bounce back jobs. The pandemic comes and it goes and those people go back to their jobs. And just last week, Joe Biden admitted that on social media. I don't know if he knew what he admitted, but that's what it said. I wonder who drew it. Perhaps that person is no longer employed by the Democrats. But right now, it's even worse than that. Under Kamala Harris's policies, three million workers are now missing from the job force compared to 2020. Three million workers, that's a lot. Over half a million fewer people have full-time jobs today than just one year ago. And 100% of the net job creation in the past year has gone to illegal Migrants, think of that. 100% of the jobs created under this administration has gone to illegal migrants that came into our country. Now, let's keep going. Now he's going to talk about energy. And this is where the huge contrast. The only way to bring down prices is to produce more energy and lower the world cost of oil uh, dramatically. we got to overproduce to drive down the cost of oil so that the cost to produce everything we consume uh, and the cost to transport everything we get goes down. That's how you lower prices. Here's Donald Trump on energy yesterday, cut 21. First, I will end Kamala Harris's anti-energy crusade and implement a policy of energy abundance, energy independence, and even energy dominance. We have more liquid gold under our feet than any other country, including Russia and Saudi Arabia. We'll be using it. My plan will cut energy prices in half or more than that within 12 months of taking office. It will be an economic revival of our country like no one has ever seen before. I stop energy right here. Was Boy, do we need that. Um, I'm looking at, at markets this morning. I'll do the market report in the next segment. But I'll, I'll tell you, 
we have got to get back to growth. We are all, we're going to tip into a recession, I think. I expect maybe the Fed will, the jobs report comes out later today. And if it's another bad jobs report, because it's been going down, 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 they revised all the numbers. It's all been fake for a year. I think we're already in a recession, I think. But we will, we will find out more later today. Then Trump went to the ridiculous EPA attempt to destroy America's power industry, cut 22. Under the EPA's so-called power plant rule, more than 50 power plants have been shut down since she took office, and virtually all coal-fired power plants will be shuttered in the next couple of years, setting the stage for a catastrophic energy shortfall, which we already have, that will make inflation far worse than it has ever been. Okay, keep going because this, this is the key part, what he's going to do with the Green New Deal that got passed, the so-called misnamed Inflation Reduction Act, cut number 23. Second, to further defeat inflation, my plan will terminate the Green New Deal, which I call the Green New Scam, greatest scam in history probably, a $10 trillion scam that we waste, we throw, like throwing money right out the window it actually sets us back as opposed to moves us forward and rescind all unspent funds under the misnamed Inflation Reduction Act, which the Democrats agreed after it was approved that it wasn't for that purpose. It was for other purposes like giveaways. Kamala spent $7.5 billion to build eight charging stations. Think of a charging station. Now, you know, they, they argue that they built 64 charging stations. That's their big retort. It's not eight at 64. I don't care. It was wasted, wasted, wasted and inflationary. Now, I want you to pay particularly close attention if you're in Scranton and you're listening on the Bull Gold Media's The Talker on 94.3, or you're listening in Erie, Pennsylvania on Talk Erie 103.3 and 105.9 and 1530 AM. Uh, Donald Trump is going to turn your state into a, a giant engine of economic growth because you're going after fracking big time and he's going to stop blowing up the power plants he's going to get people back to work in pennsylvania and producing and working and if you elect if, if pennsylvania if you elect kamala Harris president just say goodbye to the keystone state uh back to the key thing the best thing he said yesterday cut 25 third i will launch a historic campaign to liberate our economy from crippling regulation my first term, I pledged to cut two old regulations for every one new regulation, and we did much better than that, as I've said. Yet over the past four years, Kamala has added $6,300 a year in regulatory costs onto the backs of the typical American family. Think of that. I think it's actually this. higher than that because of the cost of housing where uh, regulations by the EPA, the Army Corps of Engineers, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service work to effectively keep the housing shortage everywhere, driving up housing prices everywhere. But he'll get at that. He'll take the ax back to regulations. Cut number 26. This is the key. The, the fifth pillar of my plan is to make the Trump tax cuts permanent. They are massive tax cuts, biggest ever, permanent and to cut taxes even more, and we will have no tax on tips, something which they copied four weeks after I said it. She got I it. love she that. No he, he's not going to let him forget. It was his idea. They stole it because it matters a lot in places like Nevada and, and other places, wherever anyone is a service worker. You know, we left a tip last night at Street & Company, and whoever got that tip is going to get taxed on it unless Donald Trump wins, because the Democrats won't pass it. Uh, Kamala Harris was talking up in an attempt to stop her hemorrhaging. By the way, three new national polls yesterday, Emerson, Rasmussen, Morning Consult, they're all within the margin of error. One's got Trump ahead, two's got Harris ahead, but it's, it doesn't matter because statistic, statistically insignificant. They're tied nationally, which means Trump is ahead, but I, I think he's winning Pennsylvania and Georgia handily. One more cut from the, the speech yesterday. Cut number 30, this matters, especially for Pennsylvania, Georgia, and South Carolina. We will ensure that the United States has a giant steel industry an aluminum industry, a manufacturing base, and a defense base. We want a industrial base that can take care of our defense needs 100%. And you can call it what you want. Some might say it's economic nationalism. I call it 
common sense. I call it America first. I love that line so much. I call it common sense because that's what it is. Dump the regulations. Let Americans work again. Don't tax them to death. Let the free market do the free market thing. Vote for Trump. Wherever you are, get out and vote early. North Carolina, you can start voting today. Delaware, you can start voting today. Go and vote for Trump. We need him back in the White House. I'll be right back on the Hugh Hewitt Show. Portions of the Hugh Hewitt Show are brought to you in part by AmFed, Coin, and Bullion. Go to AmericanFederal.com for more info. Welcome back, America. Hugh Hewitt, joined by Tarzana Joe, poet laureate of the Hugh Hewitt Show. Hello, Joe. Hello, you. I think I've written a poem this week that you can relate to. Let's see. Not too far in the future, a week from Tuesday next, will mark a special moment for an influential text. They'd won a war for freedom, the northern and the southern, and now they had to show the world they had the skills to govern. From May until September, they met and talked and crafted a plan to form a human union which select committees draft. It came about through compromise and surely had some flaws, but did something remarkable. It framed liberty with laws. The rule of we the people with monarchies contrasted, but through care and amendment no plan has longer lasted. Some smart guys, most with tenure, use op-eds now to state, the Constitution's dangerous and clearly out of date. And though through jurisprudence the marvel has been polished, it's lived beyond its usefulness and ought to be abolished. I've often seen a pundit, even quite a skilled one, tear down an institution, but it's rare to see them build one. Let's see what they have in mind, every word and letter. You say you have the answers? Show me something better. That's uh, Happy Birthday, U.S. Constitution by Tarzana Joe. I love that, Joe. I love you are anticipating the anniversary of the Constitution. I thought I might hear Miracle in Philadelphia in there somewhere. That's the best book on what was the Miracle in Philadelphia, how they sat there that long, hot summer in Philadelphia with Ben Franklin and George Washington and James Madison, Alexander Hamilton. That's a fabulous poem. What inspired you to do that, Joe? Well, I, it just popped up in my feed the other day that the birthday of the Constitution was coming up. And I thought, it's it's so lightly celebrated in America. We have the 4th of July. We have our other national holidays. But Constitution Day uh, it barely passes with a notation on my Apple Watch. But this year it did. Well, good why. for you. It should. I. I want everyone to go to TarzanaJoe.com and send the link to everyone, especially high school civics teachers, because the Constitution is a marvel, it is a miracle, and it is very, very strong as amended and interpreted. I always like to say that. Thank you for that, Joe. Joe, how is poetry business as we round into the end of, of summer and the beginning of fall? Wonderful. It couldn't be better. Well, let's see if we can prove him wrong. Tarzana Joe at Reagan.com for all your poetry needs. Let's bury Joe under a request for commissions. Tarzana Joe at Reagan.com. Rates are reasonable. Despite inflation, Joe holds the line. Tarzana Joe at Reagan.com. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Hugh. But gold does not stay stable. Gold rocketed it up again yesterday. $2,547 an ounce. If you're going to buy or sell gold, do it with our friends at American Federal. 800-221-7694. That's 800-221-7694. Tell Nick Grovich and his team, you're listening to the radio show, you finally are getting off your rear end, and you're calling because you want to sell some gold because you need the money, or you want to buy some gold because you want an inflation hedge. And you're afraid that the Fed is going to cut rates, but inflation isn't going to go down because there's still too much money in the system and we have a trillion dollar deficit this year. Again, if you want to buy gold and you want to do it with people who are fair and reasonable, 800 221 7694. Yesterday, the Dow was down a half a point. The SP was down 0.3 of a point. The NASDAQ actually went up a quarter point as people desperately try and find some way to make money in this rot, rot, rotten absolutely wretched economy and they're doing it frequently with gold 
and they're putting more and more money. I mean, more and more people are buying gold. China is buying gold hand over fist. That's why the, the price is so high, and they're not going to stop. But I don't know where the price is going. I just can tell you that over the last 100 years, gold more than kept pace with inflation. So call 800-221-7694. And don't forget your relief factor. All right, that's your relief factor. Uh, I want you to take Icarin, Curcumin, Resveratrol, and Omega. Icarin, Curcumin, Resveratrol, and Omega. The four pills that I take every single morning. And I do it for a simple reason. Did six miles yesterday. Uh, shorter bit this morning because I got a conference call in a, in a few hours. We got to do about um, the YouTube channel, uh, which is kicking. I mean, it's just going crazy. You people are watching my YouTube videos. Some of you just want to listen to example to Dr. Michael Oren. So I got to go out and move fast this morning, and I will because I feel good. ReliefFactor.com. Despite being out late last night with the Norkies and uh, heading over to Street and Company in Portland, I, no, no, doesn't matter. Relief Factor works around the clock, but you got to take it. 1-800-4-RELIEF. Use Relief Factor in any search engine or just go direct to relieffactor.com and get that discounted first pack. Three-week supply, 1995. Try it. You will thank me. Stay tuned. I'll be right back on the Hugh Hewitt Show, hopefully with Michael Lauren. Welcome back, America. I'm here to do it. I especially want to welcome our brand new listening audience. We started a week ago in Clovis, New Mexico on AM 1240 uh, talk in Clovis. It also is in the Amarillo market. So we, we catch two states there and two important states. If you live in Texas, vote for Ted Cruz and Donald Trump. If you live in New Mexico, vote for Nella Domenici and Donald Trump. Uh, it's a reach, but we can do it. In New Mexico, and I'm so glad to have a new outpost, outpost, outpost for what I've been doing. And I, I'm not going to spend time telling the listeners in Clovis, New Mexico, who I am or why I'm doing. I've been doing this since 1990, and we've got uh, 480 affiliates for a reason. Uh, we know what we're doing. One of the things that this show is appreciated for is we bring you actually the newsmakers themselves, like JD Vance this week. Or when they give important addresses and speeches, I make sure you hear them as opposed to legacy media telling you, oh, it wasn't very good or blah, 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 blah. Here is Donald Trump yesterday. He taped a video for the gathering of the Republican Jewish um, coalition in Las Vegas. And I think it's important you hear it all. Cut number 36, President Trump talking to the RJC by video. Cut number 36. As we speak today, we're all devastated by the horrific death of our fellow American, Hirsch, Goldman, and, and this is so sad to even say, Hirsch, Goldberg, Poland. I've been watching the parents. I've been watching everybody talking about it for so long, and it's just so sad to see. And the five other innocent hostages slaughtered late last week at the hands of Hamas terrorists. Hirsch was a brother, a son, and an American citizen after being held captive for nearly a year following the monstrous October 7th attack on Israel. Hirsch was barbarically executed with a bullet to the back of his head. To Hirsch's family and everyone touched by these atrocities, we pray that God will grant you comfort, healing, and peace. And as for the evil savages responsible for these murders, may they never know peace or comfort ever again. I cannot know it. I love that sentiment. I also want to know, he made a mistake, right? He said Hirsch. Gold and, and then he said Hirsch Goldberg Poland, and he got it right. That's the difference between Donald Trump and Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. You can screw up a teleprompter. You might momentarily. I've mispronounced about a billion names in my life, but Donald Trump has the capacity to be. Oh, I screwed that up. Go back and get it right. Uh, and so I, Joe Biden can't do that. Kamala Harris would be flustered and cackling. He continues on talking to the RJC. Cut number thirty-seven. I will keep America safe, and I will work with you to make sure that Israel is with us for thousands of years. We're not going to let go of it. If they win, Israel is gone. Just remember that. If they win, Israel is gone. You can forget about Israel. That's what's going to happen. So they have to get out on November 5th, and they have to vote for Trump. If they don't, I think it's going to be a very Terrible situation. We're going to make America great again. 
We're going to, frankly, help Israel become great again. Right now, what you're going through is horrible that you have to go through that. With all the death, destruction, and waste, and ruining a civilization, you have to go. You have to win, but you need a partner. You can never have that partner if these radical Marxists win the election. So I thank you, and God bless Israel. God bless America. I'll see you soon. Thank you very much. Uh, I think he's right. Uh, They will never win. Israel will not be permitted to win. By winning, that means the destruction of Hamas, the destruction of Hezbollah, and the deterrence of Iran, and and the uh, reduction of Iran's nuclear capacity. One more cut from the RJC yesterday, cut number 38. With the historic Abraham Accords, we made peace in the Middle East. We had wonderful support. And had I been president for the remainder of that time that we're talking about, this four-year period, everybody, every country virtually would have been signed into the Abraham Accords, whereas Biden and Harris have done nothing. Nobody signed. So here at home, American Jews felt safe on our streets and college campuses when I was president, and we kept radical Islamic terrorists out of our country. They were out. They weren't allowed to come in. But all of that changed with Comrade Kamala Harris and Crooked Joe Biden in the White House. Comrade Kamala is pretty good. I like that. One more cut. I I lied. I have one more cut because Donald Trump reminds people who are friends of Israel, and this show is, right? I'm I'm not Jewish. Uh, I've been to Israel a grand total of two times. It's a democracy. It's the equal of any ally we have in the world. It's a nuclear power. They are our friends. They are our close allies. We need to stand by them and stop beating up on them. Blinken's back trying to say, best and final offer. Hamas isn't taking any offer. Not taking any offer. They just executed an American. And we're back pounding on Israel. Cut number 39, Donald Trump reviewing his record as president. When I left office, America was safe. Israel was safe. The Jewish people were safe. And the whole world was at peace. Under my leadership, we obliterated the ISIS caliphate 100% done. We did it in four weeks. It was supposed to take five years. I did it in four weeks, and it was done, over. I withdrew from the horrendous Iran nuclear deal and imposed the toughest ever sanctions on the regime. Iran was weak. Iran was broke. They had no money, and they wanted to make a deal. As president, I withdrew from the anti-Semitic United Nations Human Rights Council, which is terrible, absolutely terrible. I defunded the Palestinian Authority and choked off the money to Hamas. And we actually defunded. We were paying them a fortune every year. The United States was paying a fortune. And I said, we're not going to pay. They're not our friends and not the friend of Israel. I recognized Israel's eternal capital and opened the American embassy in Jerusalem, something which every president said they were going to do, and they never did it. You see, I I just think there isn't, if you're a supporter of Israel, you have to vote for Donald Trump. This war would be over. It would have been over three months ago. He would not have stopped Israel from going into Rafah. They might have been able to get into Rafah and get those hostages before they were executed. The, uh, the only way to end this war is to get Sinwar, kill him, or let him go into exile in return for the hostages. And had they taken that line from the beginning, no quarter until you surrender and you can go to Iran, which paid for it. Uh, on Monday, I'll be talking with Dan Sinwar about this because we have a lot to talk about. And boy, any American who supports Israel, Jewish or not Jewish, you've just got to vote for Donald Trump or you're not a serious supporter of Israel because this regime, uh, Biden-Harris, and then that Harris walls. Walls I worry about. I don't think he knows where any country in the world is except China where he's been 30 times. 30 times! 30 times, 3-0. That is alarming. All right, back to uh, Trump's speech to the Economic Club yesterday because he talked about housing. And... Yeah, you know, one of my kids wants to move up in a house, and but he they're 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 starter home. Uh, they've got a, a starter home, and the interest rate's one of those crazy, ridiculous Trump rates. The Trump rates were between two and a half and three three and a half percent, and now the Biden rates are at six and a half to seven percent. And so we were walking through the math last night, and I told him to call Andrew and Todd dot com, and he'll do that. 
But more importantly, for all the young people out there who want to move up who are stuck in, in Trump rates and not stuck, they're, they're blessed by having a low interest rate. We can get those back down and we can increase the housing supply. Donald Trump talked about that specifically yesterday. Cut number 32, Donald Trump at the New York Economic Club. Housing much more affordable. As inflation is tamed, interest rates will dramatically fall. They'll be down very, very low. We'll get them down. We had them down to 2.4 percent and even lower than that for a period of time. Reducing mortgage rates is a big factor. We're going to get them back down to, we think, 3%, maybe even lower than that, saving the average home buyer thousands of dollars per year. They can now go out. Young people will be able to buy a home again and be a part of the American dream. We will eliminate regulations that drive up housing costs with the goal of cutting the cost of a new home in half. We think we can do that. The regulations alone cost 30%. Regulation costs 30% of a new home, and we will open up portions of federal land for large-scale housing construction. These zones will be ultra-low tax and ultra-low regulation. One of the great, really small business job creation programs, it will be of all time. We're going to open up our country. I want to stop there. When I heard that, I said, that is great. There's federal land all over the United States, lots of it. If you simply give it, or hold an auction with the big developers. And I used to work, I'm retired from the active practice of the law now. I'll still help out with family members and I'm teaching con law and I've kept my bar practice going, but I, I'm, I'm no longer working four jobs. I only have three jobs now. And I stopped practicing law, but for 30 years, I was out there in the federal government and then for 25 of those 30 years representing large landowners and developers. And I mean, the biggest names on the West Coast, Pardee, Lusk, Kaufman and Broad, you name it, Warmington. I, I represented all these folks. And if you brought them in, and I, I spent two years trying to get the city of North Las Vegas to let party buy and build on about uh, two square miles. And if Trump had been in charge, and it, it involved a land swap with the Bureau of Land Management, that's what I did. I was a, I was a regulatory genius. And so I would go in and I'd get the agencies to do something. Didn't come through. Regulatory genius wasn't enough because the BLM is just the most broken agency in the world after the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the EPA, and half of the Army Corps of Engineers. Half of the Army Corps of Engineers knows what they're doing and half just completely goofy. And you have to get all these people working together, and then you got to get the state and the local regulations to go. If Trump comes in and says, we're going to give you a ground lease on federal land, and there are no regulations, build houses, we will approve a high-density plan. We'll have housing prices plummet. There's a lot of federal land near you, whether or not you know it. That was, that was fabulous when he said that. That was absolutely fabulous. I hope you put that in Dwayne's World. Dwayne, Dwayne's World's coming out today, right? MyPhdWeightLoss.com, time 864-644-1900. That's 864-644-1900. For our new listeners in Clovis, uh, Skinny Dwayne is the producer of The Hugh Hewitt Show, the executive producer, and he's been doing so for 25 years. Adam's been the uh, senior engineer for 25 years, and Harley's been here off and on for five years. We know what we're doing. And Dwayne does a podcast called Dwayne's World, but more importantly, Dwayne makes money for the show because he lost the weight, and he can come on and do a testimonial every day that myphdweightloss.com actually works. So what do you say to the people who want to lose some pounds in Clovis, generally, Simo? Don't take all the pills. Don't get hooked on a thousand a month uh, sentence for the rest of your life. Do it the old-fashioned way with accountability, eating decent food, and um, you can lose the weight and you can keep it off. It's easy enough my, to do. MyPhdWeightLoss.com or 864-644-1900. And I add, go get Dwayne's World if you want to hear all. That's a podcast that will drop later. I think he put the entire Trump speech into it today. Dwayne's World drops today. Go and get that. I'll be right back. America, stay tuned. Welcome back, America. I'm Hugh Hewitt. I want you to know I'll be out on the road with my fellow hosts on the radio and the Salem News Channel uh, beginning in late October. Go to battlegroundtour.com to find out who's going to be where. I'm doing Detroit, Columbus, and Pittsburgh. 
before getting back to the Beltway. I have to pull up stakes early up here in the north and get back to the Beltway because of the presidential election. All the details, tickets available at battlegroundtour.com. Those always sell out. We do this every four years. It always sells out, and I appreciate when the audiences come out to tell us what they think. And boy, Detroit matters a lot. Uh, Columbus matters because we've got to elect Bernie Marino. Pennsylvania matters a lot because we've got to elect not only Dave McCormick to the Senate, Pennsylvania's got to go for Trump. Yesterday's Economic Club speech, and again, I, I will tell you, if you want to hear most of it, almost all of it, Listen to Dwayne's World today, his podcast, because that will have all of it. I don't have enough time in the morning to cover all this with the various stuff I've got to do. I want to play two more cuts for you uh, on what the former president said at the New York Economic Club. And I underscore New York Economic Club is where you go to make major addresses on domestic economic and international economic order. You go to the Reagan uh, forum on defense to talk about military matters. You go to the Nixon Grand Strategy Summit in Washington, D.C. to talk about grand strategy. Those are the three places you make big speeches. Well, yesterday I made a big speech at the New York Economic Club. Now, legacy media is involved in a, in a cloak of silence. They're hiding Tim Walz's buffoonery from you. Kamala Harris isn't anywhere. And Donald Trump has just done foxnews.com, counted it up yesterday. They're, they're up to 40 to 42 different interviews and appearances between Vance and Trump. I've had both Trump and Vance on the last two weeks, and, and he's out there talking to everyone all the time, but when he gives a major address, you should listen. Cut number 18. Under Kamala, the United States is becoming a third world banana republic. She and her party are censoring speech, weaponizing the justice system, and trying to throw their political opponents, me, in jail. This hasn't happened. I didn't do that to Crooked Hillary. I said, that would be a terrible thing, wouldn't it? Putting the wife of the president of the United States in jail. But they view it differently, I guess, nowadays, but that's okay. And they always have to remember that two can play the game. Nobody ever thought this was possible. This is how you create massive capital flight and turn once prosperous nations into absolute ruins. I will have no higher priority as president than to restore the fair, equal, and impartial rule of law in America. Up right there, have- that is the most important thing he has said. We have got to stop the federal government from weaponizing DOJ, whether it's against Trump, whether it's against pro-life demonstrators, whether it's against Elon Musk, whether it's putting their finger on the scale. We've got to get them out of power. They are doing terrible things to the American ability to attract capital, to grow. They are persecuting political enemies. Merrick Garland is is a complete embarrassment. He's befuddled. He's befuddled as Joe Biden. President Biden, by the way, was out yesterday. This poor guy. I actually feel bad for him. Cut number 40, Joe Biden yesterday. My, uh, my investments, that through my investments, the most significant climate change law ever. And by the way, it is a $369 billion bill. It's called the, uh, we, we should have named it what it was, but at uh, but any rate. <laughs> he, he, he knows he went off script for a moment. He looked away and he said, we should have named it what it was, the Inflation Creation Act. Right. Instead, he wanted to say we should have named it what it was, the Green New Deal. But they didn't because inflation was killing them at the polls. It is going to kill them at the polls. But it, it's just sad. He does not have the capacity to be president. We are in a constitutional crisis. So I want to go to the polls to close this hour. Emerson, Harris, 49, Trump, 47. That, that's just a coin flip. Uh, yesterday, Rasmussen, Trump, 47, Harris, 46. That's just a coin flip. National polling. The elect- uh, this is not the Electoral College. This is coin, coin toss stuff. Uh, morning consult. Harris 49. Trump 46. Still margin of error. Doesn't matter. Does not matter because the popular vote doesn't elect anyone. Nate Silver, the analyst who's a man of the left, does 538. He has a model where he projects the final electoral count, and then he gives a probability, like betting odds. There's almost a 57% chance that Donald Trump is going to win the election, according to Nate Silver. In 2016, Nate Silver said there was a 20%. I listened to the commentary podcast yesterday, and I'd forgotten this. Nate Silver caught all sorts of heck from the left because he said Trump might win this. He wasn't even remotely close. Trump won handily. 
But I was on the stage that night with James Carville, Chuck Todd, Tom Brokaw, Savannah Guthrie, and Lester Holt. And James was just turning white as he saw the New York odds meter go from 100% Hillary to oh, 100% Trump. I think the same thing is happening. I think we are just tired to death of these people, these left-wing extremists. There are 3,000 of them. When you elect a president, you elect 3,000 people. And the 3,000 people who came with Biden are hard left. The 3,000 people who are going to come with Comrade Kamala are going to be even worse, and they're going to be incompetent like Kamala is. you got to get out and vote for Trump. And if you're my new audience in New Mexico, turn out. If you've never turned out, wherever you're in Pennsylvania or Georgia or North Carolina, Wisconsin, Michigan, Arizona, Nevada, you are the keys to this election. The other states are locked in. I think Georgia's locked in, too. But you've got to get out, register to vote, and make sure you vote. You can start voting today in North Carolina and Delaware. Go vote for Trump. All right, go vote for Trump. I'll be right back. Hour number two, straight ahead. Morning, glory, America. Bonjour, hi, Canada. I'm Hugh Hewitt. Welcome and a special good morning to our brand new affiliate in Clovis, New Mexico. Clovis, New Mexico, KCLV AM 1240. And that goes from Clovis all the way over to Amarillo. And it's Cannon Air Force Base. I always love when we get a military uh, area added in because that means people are on their way to work early. And we love that. But Today, as I talk with Ben Dominich, editor-at-large at The Spectator, I also want to pay particular attention to our friends in Scranton and Wilkes-Barre on 94.3, The Talker, and to TalkErie.com, and to our affiliates in Philly and Pittsburgh and all across the Keystone State. Listen up. Ben and I are going to talk to you about this election in Pennsylvania. Good morning, Ben. How are you? I'm good, Hugh, and uh, it's uh, it's great to finally have football back. I, oh, isn't I it? I have to say, isn't it? It's just it, you you get to that portion near the end of August, and it's just like, ah, oh, man, I guess I can't wait for this. And uh, I'm I'm uh, I, I don't know about your attitude toward this season, but I just have uh, I I can't wait to have the the distraction of it uh, <laughs> to have something to focus on other than the election. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm a little bit worried about Penn State. I'm a Buckeyes fan, coming as I yeah. do from Warren, Ohio, and Penn State looked awfully good last they week. really do they yes. might be the second best team in the big 10 michigan screwed up but I, yeah. I i i do think the buckeyes georgia and penn state are the best three teams in the country do you have a particular favorite ben who do you root for on saturday so so um i, I so I, I have a couple of different allegiances since i went to Leon and mary you know it's not in the same category <laughs> yeah, but, your uh, navy's the, homecoming game uh, but i'm uh no but, but i my parents went to virginia tech uh, and wow. I am not happy with the result, obviously, of that. Oh, that's right. <laughs> so, um, the, so I, you know, I, I uh, go along with them when when they're rooting. But I also have a lot of friends who root for the Longhorns, and oh. you know, frankly, I think that the uh, the pass, the schedule that uh, that some of these teams have uh, is really going to be so determinative. And if you look at Georgia's schedule down the down the path, I mean, the end of season is just brutal for them and so if they can they'll make the that, 12 though they'll make the 12 <laughs> oh, uh, yeah you know, georgia is a power out kirby is so brilliant yeah and it's yes. going to be ryan day and kirby will be in the 12 and then I, we'll I see let me you're ask you right. on the pro side of course we're only browns fans here and we sh- i should tell my new affiliate if you're not a browns fan just go home no I, I don't mean that we don't you're probably part of cowboys the browns take on the cowboys sunday afternoon late like 4 15 or 4 30 start uh who are you picking in that one ben I like the Browns in that one. I think the defense is really good, and I think that uh, you know Dak is is in this kind of rough position this year, and I think that they could get a slow start to their season, uh, given that, and given the fact that they really have to just rely on CD. It's not, they don't really have the same kind of weapons that they used to, um, and I think that the Browns uh, defense is just going to be really good this year. No, it's awesome, and and yeah. they just they just signed JOK to a three year extension. It's fabulous. But now here's a, a quick question for you. Yesterday I'm listening to my favorite sports pod. I have a theory which I'm going to lay out to you, but but this is a, a adjacent theory. 
I think sports pods are keeping old media alive in places like the Cleveland Plain Dealer, which is now cleveland.com, and my favorite podcast there. They've got many, like Orange and Brown Talk, Buckeye Talk, but they have Terry's talking. Terry Polito is 69 years old. He's been doing this since he started as a baseball reporter in Baltimore 50 years ago, and he is so smart. Dave Campbell's their editor. He is so smart. Yesterday, they raised the question, why are the Cowboys America's team? Because actually, there are all sorts of teams, and I hate the Cowboys. I, I have a theory, but I want to, before I put, trap mine out, why do you think the Cowboys is, quote, America's team? Well, it's just, I mean, it's a wonderful branding, uh, you know, approach. And, and for, you know, the generation of, of baby boomers that still, you know, hold, has such a hold on uh, our thought process, you know, they, tr- they truly do qualify in that capacity. And, of course, and when it comes to media, if you're talking about the Cowboys, you're getting more eyeballs than you are if you're talking about, almost any other franchise. And so I think that's a big part of it too, just that, you know, it's, it, it is a point of argument uh, across the country in a way that, uh, you know, you don't necessarily have and the flashy characters involved, uh, you know, play an outsized role in our discussion, but I don't believe that they're America's team anymore. And I don't think that they're going to be America's team in this season. I think that there's uh, going to be a lot of rooting interest in these young quarterbacks across the, across the, the league that is just, uh, it, it, very impressive. I mean, I'm looking forward to see what what Jordan Love and Jalen Hurts look like tonight. Yep. Uh, but I, my so. theory, simply put, is that Roger Staubach made them America's team because of That's the Naval Academy. Thing. And because he was so good and because in the old days there weren't as many teams, that that's when the branding began and it stuck. I know my late father-in-law, Colonel in the Marine Corps, all he would watch was the Cowboys because Roger went to the Naval Academy. And I think that actually began the network, that if you were a Naval Academy person, you rooted for Roger. I don't know, did your father-in-law root for Roger? (laughs) <laughs> so uh he did yes absolutely yeah. uh, though, though of course he loved uh he adopted and loved the cardinals and uh became very close friends with larry fitzgerald and oh interesting uh, and, and uh yes yes in fact larry uh, uh larry was one of his uh, eulogists actually at the at the uh, uh we're talking the, about uh, senator mccain for the steelers uh, fans yeah. they're a little bit uh, slow so we got to clue yeah. them in okay yeah. so ben um, <laughs> let's get to the steelers fans because god God save us. The election hangs on Steelers fans. Uh, and, and so I, because of Vince Benedetto, who's a West Point guy, he owns a bunch of radio stations in Pennsylvania. I'm on from Scranton and then Salem's got one in Philly and they've got one in, uh, in Pittsburgh and I'm up on Talk Erie. I'm all over the state. What, how goes yesterday? The biggest poll of the week is the one that came out that showed McCormick is tied with Bob Casey in mm-hmm. September. What do you think's mm-hmm. going on there? Well, I think that uh, I think that Pennsylvania really is going to be an area where uh, Kamala Harris is going to struggle more than we you know without the kind of connections that Joe Biden had, at least um, you know in, in terms of the way he presented it uh, to uh, to Pennsylvania, and just given the dynamics and the and the uh, you know elements at play here, you see that I mean the embrace of John Fetterman and that kind of thing, but you know that there was so much resistance on his side. Uh, for walking away from Joe Biden, you know he was the you know one of the last holdouts in that uh, reported Senate meeting of Democrats, where he was saying, you know, you just can't walk away from him. And he's saying that not just out of personal loyalty, but he's saying it because he knows that's going to hurt them in his state. Um, and so I think that Democrats are should be worried about Pennsylvania. They should be very worried about the dynamics there because the the case that they have in this election is not one that speaks to the priorities in, in Pennsylvania and uh, the the whole culture war element of things, I think, doesn't play uh, in a state that really has a lot of economic concerns, a lot of concerns that don't run in the direction uh, of those culture war priorities that may make the you know other parts of the country more competitive uh, in terms of her ability to reach into urban communities and that kind of thing uh, that perhaps would have been a little bit tougher and has been trending in Trump's direction. Uh, but Pennsylvania is not one of those states. Now, there are four big issues in this election. The economy, uh, the infl- uh, that means inflation, energy, and all that stuff. Crime, migration, that's all under one heading. Then you have abortion. It's a real issue. Then you have support for Israel, national security. That's, a, that's an umbrella. I think Trump is ahead. And, uh, I just don't believe Pennsylvanians believe Kamala Harris on fracking. Do you? No, I don't think so. And the other thing is that I think that she underestimates the uh, the negative reaction to someone who flips on a dime without explaining it. 
Um, This is the most obvious question in the world. Um, And yet when she was asked it in her one CNN interview with uh, Tim Walls along as as her emotional support puppy, the 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 situation there you know was one where she should have anticipated that question and had a completely constructed answer for why she changed her mind on the issue why she has a new position on it because people need to hear a reason it it doesn't necessarily need to be a great reason but they need to hear some kind of rationale instead she basically just waves her hand and is just like oh yeah well you know i my values are the same, and it, it's just, you know, I'm in a different position now. People don't believe that. They have to have a rationale, a story that says, this is why I've changed my mind. Once I got into the vice presidency, I discovered this, this, this. And I think that this is something that's actually important for these communities. And I've, you know, uh, and that's why I believe what I believe now. Uh, whatever explanation she wanted to come up with, she needed to come up with one, and she did and, and, you know, Trump gave this speech. I played most of it in the first hour, all of it. It will be on Dwayne's World, his podcast later today. He hammered on energy, hammered, hammered, hammered on energy because it's the only way to bring down costs. You've got to lower the cost of producing goods and transporting goods. And you can only do that with energy. Do you think that's getting through, Ben? 30 seconds to the break. We'll talk during the break and then come back. I think that it is getting through, and I think that people are beginning uh, to understand that this is an area where they need to uh, have some focus and, and really hit at the Democratic ticket. Uh, they're, they are radicals on this issue. People understand that they're radicals. Uh, and I think that this is, you know, Trump's focus on those four issues that you talked about uh, is, I think, going to be the decisive element of the, of the run to the finish line. Uh, During the break, I'm going to talk with Ben Dominich. You can follow on X at B Dominich. You can read him at The Spectator. We'll talk about his podcast when we come back. And it'll all be on Highly Concentrated Hue later today. And also, I'll post it at YouTube because people love to hear Ben analyze things on Friday. Don't go anywhere, America. I'm Hugh Hewitt. Uh, Ben, J.D. Vance was on the program on uh, Mm -hmm. Wednesday, and I asked him about Tim Walls and what his problems were. And he said, well, to begin with, he's a little too close to Hamas and the people who support (laughs) Hamas up in Minnesota. And, you know, we put out a press release like we did because I thought, wow, that that's provocative and it's interesting. No pickup. Zero pickup. It's like the (laughs) it's like the media will not touch anything about Hamas and the Democratic Party and the pro-Palestinian that demonstrators are back at Columbia. It, they're so afraid of it. The media is so afraid of it. What, what do you make of J.D.'s comments? He's too, a, a little too close to Hamas and about the issue generally in election 2024. Well, I think that, uh, first off, the, the fact is that he is on, on paper too close to Hamas. You've, yep. I'm sure, read the comments or probably talked about them on here that he's given uh, and now in a number of different responses that uh, he's had in interviews. And Walt's just, I mean, his rationale on things uh, creates this whole moral equivalency uh, that is that is completely that is completely unacceptable, and it's not something that you know anybody should stand for. Uh, so you know when Vance I think goes after him, and he's shown it in in the uh, in his capability over the last couple of weeks to really focus in on uh, some of the radicalism that this ticket uh, represents, particularly on foreign policy, and I think that that's going to be something that he continues to do. Um, all the way going forward. And, and that, this is, I think, what what Donald Trump wanted when he picked Vance. He wanted someone who was going to be able to take on the Democrats and fight back, push back in a very uh, convincing you know, way. And I think that he's showing his capability to do that. So now all the national polls are margin of error and state polls show uh, movement towards Trump. Generally, if the election were held today and people begin voting today in Pennsylvania and Delaware and pretty soon they start in Georgia, who wins? Well, I think if people were voting today, it would be in, in, in perhaps a close Harris win, but the trajectory does not look good for her, uh, meaning it, it's all margin of error. It's all very close. But I think that what's happened is we've seen them come out of Chicago without any bump uh, because they already got the, as much of a bump as they were going to get from the ticket change. Uh, and I think that Donald Trump, as long as he has the ability to keep focus on these different radical uh, policies that these people represent, uh, I think that the momentum really is going in his favor now. And I, I think that there's concern among the Harris team about how to do, deal with that, in part because 
you know, they're scared about putting her out there more in any kind of unscripted environment because she's shown her capability to create such problems for herself. That's why you She's say, a terrible candidate. You know, I mentioned in yeah, the first segment, yeah. your, your late father-in-law. I still say the funniest moment in 25 years of radio is when, after Trump beat up on me one day, uh, Senator McCain called up and said, you loser, Hugh Hewitt. And it was the funniest damn thing I've ever heard. <laughs> She has no capacity for humor at all, does she? No, no, no. It's totally, and for someone who laughs as much as she does, it's really, it's, it's really ironic. But I do think that one of the things that we should keep in mind here is th- the whole narrative about her is that she represents like this, this uh, you know, inspiring force for the new. Um, when in reality, what she actually represents, to me at least, is something that is going backward. It's actually removing the candidate from being closer to the people. It's pushing her further away uh, from a capability to talk to norm, normal, everyday Americans. Instead, you have all of these scripted events, even down to the, you know, the Doritos incident, you know, where it's like we have to plan everything and because if we don't plan it out, then she, she's going to make a mistake. And I think that her incapacity, her inability to do this, her capacity for being able to relate to normal people is just so low uh, that it's going to be a continual problem, even in this short uh, race to the finish. Welcome back, America. Ben Dominich, editor at large for The Spectator, great commentator, Fox News contributor, really a great way to end the week. Uh, ben, uh, I don't get to give advice to Donald Trump. I'm not on his team. But if I could, I did it to Cud- Larry Kudlow asked me this week, on what would your advice be? And I said, don't pay any attention to her. Say nothing to her. Respond to nothing. Ask the moderators questions that they should be asking her. If it was possible to do it without being too brusque, I'd say talk to the hand. You know, just nothing. Yeah. Don't respond to her and go after the moderators for not asking her tough questions. What's your advice to Donald Trump? I think that's really good advice. Uh, I think one of the things that he should be prepared for is for the the moderators in this instance to try to tee up some questions that speak more to her issue set, uh, meaning that they're going to, I think, ask about a lot of the different uh, race and uh, and culture war focused things to a much greater degree than they did in the first uh, debate with Joe Biden, uh, in part because that's more of her comfort zone. Um, at the same time, I think that the, there's a real opportunity for her uh, to uh, there's a real opportunity that she will end up uh, running into some serious challenges when it comes to answering questions about foreign policy uh, and, and about you know things like her switch on fracking, things like that. And I think that Trump would be wise to just let that play out. Like he shouldn't uh, respond to any of bait that she's planned to throw at him. He shouldn't you know take any of those kind of uh, you know, opportunities to go after her and become nasty on stage. That's, I think, the one thing he needs to really guard against. Uh, instead, I think he has, you know, even though they're very different candidates, letting her tie herself in knots is not a bad approach here because I think that she's shown her capacity to do it time and again. You now, Ben, I, I am working on a Washington Post column, which I think is next week, and it's about the rise of the pods. What's the name of your podcast, Ben? <laughs> the Ben Dominich Podcast. Super interesting. The ben, there you go. <laughs> I, I have a theory. My theory is that this is a make or break moment for ABC. If they screw this up, if they go left, uh, they'll lose, they'll shed audience forever. They'll be branded. In the meanwhile, we've got Ruthless, you, me, Dwayne World. I've got highly concentrated you. I listen to the commentary pod every day, Mary Catherine Ham getting hammered. I listen to Dan Senor. I've got about eight political podcasts. I think they're killing broadcast news because yeah. serious, fact-based, uh, balance. I know Trump's strengths and I know his weaknesses and I talk about him. Do you think podcasting is a threat to broadcast media? I think it's already, I mean, it's, it's supplanting <clears throat> pod, uh, uh, broadcast media in so many different ways. You know, the, the growth of so many of these different alternate sources is, is not just due to people cutting the cord and things like that. It's due to people wanting to hear different voices. There's a reason that ESPN is paying Pat McAfee all that money. There's a reason that you see the growth of Barstool Sports. And then there's the reason that you see the you know incredible explosion of political podcasts. And it's because that's the kind of discussion, the kind of quality back and forth that people want to hear. And you know where they're not getting it? They're not getting it from these eight-person panels that you see on cable news. They're not getting it from... 
uh, the, the kind of uh, very structured uh, approach to defining who is and who isn't on the right. And they certainly aren't getting it from a situation where it's a seven on one with poor Scott Jennings, you know, doing, <laughs> doing I know. his job to fight that back guy. Against, you know, he is, he's, he's amazing. He's, it's, it's it's amazing you can put up with it, but I think that the thing the thing that people actually want is a back and forth debate. That they want back and forth discussion, and they want to have different perspectives. Yeah, you know, the, the poor guys at, at Ruthless yesterday, Ben. I want to make sure people hear this, and we'll talk during the break. Brian Stelter is going back to CNN. I like Brian, right? I know he's a lefty, and I know he's wrong, but I like him. I like him. The guys at Ruthless just absolutely crushed him yesterday. What do you think about CNN bringing back Brian Stelter? You know, it's it's honestly, uh, it's not the worst thing in the world. You know, the the, the problems of their uh, coverage, I, I think, didn't uh, start and end with Brian, but he certainly was, you know, a part of a lot of the coverage there that I think is, you know, was unwilling to really look at itself in the mirror and ch- and change anything about what they did in the aftermath of promoting the whole Russiagate approach. That's something the, the you know their attitude, for instance, you can go back and see the clips of him talking about the Hunter Biden laptop and stuff like that. And they never really do that reckoning. They never go back and say, well, what did we do wrong? How did we? Yeah. And I haven't even wrong? mentioned Hunter's uh, plea deal yesterday. He could go to jail for 17 years, but it's going to be more like 17 days because after the election, he's going to get commuted. Uh, stay tuned. I'm going to talk to Ben for four more minutes about my my podcasting theory because I need his input. Because you should be listening to the Ben Dominich podcast. You should be watching Ben on Fox News. Follow him on X at B Dominich and follow us to the next segment. Stay tuned, America. The Hugh Hewitt Show is now available on TV. Go to SalemNewsChannel.com or download the app. You can also watch on Roku and Fire Stick. Salem News Channel, the antidote to the mainstream media. Ben, I think there's a generational change coming in the conservative commentary. I've always been center-right. You've always been center-right. But I'm 69, and you're under 50 by a lot. Uh, I listened to Ruthless yesterday. Those four guys, Josh Holmes has been on the show once, but I love all of them, the, the fellas. I think, uh, I think Smug is hilarious. And it was a hilarious podcast. It's an R-rated podcast. Mary Catherine Ham comes on here once a week, and I listen to her and Vic uh, every single day. Dwayne's got Dwayne's world. I think... We, meaning older people like me, I was on with Larry Kudlow this week, Grover Norquist, and Rich Lowry, after which I reflected, my God, the the total age of that group is 5,000. We're like Methuselah. And eventually, we have to give way. Are you optimistic about the rising conservative commentariat and their ability to keep pace with Pod for America, which really did blaze this trail? They really did Mm -hmm. prove that there was a demand signal for serious. They're lefties, but there's a demand signal for serious extended conversation. Do you think the the new generation, including you, is up to this? Well, I, I certainly think that it's up to the commentary side of it. You know, I mean, that when it comes to the, the kind of diaspora of younger commentators or, or millennial commentators, you know, who are now, of course, we're in our 40s, you know, the older set of us. Yeah, Guy um, Benson's and, 40, I think, now, or 39. And, so, yeah. and, yeah, and, and, and there are a number of people who I think have been doing this uh, professionally long enough in some capacity that they've really uh, honed their skills and, and become very solidly, uh, you know, uh, commentating on things in a smart and intelligent way. The thing that I'm really worried about, though, Hugh, is this. Given the number of different entities that are out there that are on the right uh, that have significant financial backing, they have the uh, you know they have you know, staff that is professional and all Ben Shapiro, it. you bet you his empire, it, 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 of course. Yeah, they're, they're actually producing far less solid journalism than I think they need to be. Um, the the fact that the left has an entity like ProPublica with the resources that it has um, is something that we really don't have on the right. And I know in the old days uh, it would, you know, people like Andrew Breitbart, you know, had hopes of building something that could contend with the New York times or then the Huffington post or something like that, that never really came to fruition. And I think that, uh, you know, organizations like YAF organizations like the fund for American studies and other places like that have tried to invest in, uh, the the careers of various people in the media, but guess what? You a lot of the people that they've produced, 
they're writing for the from a leftist perspective now. You know, uh, Tim Alberta, Jonathan Martin, you know, people like that um, uh, it, who have uh, come Tim out. Tim is a these, good friend and he was fabulous, but Trump broke him. John yeah. has been a secret leftist for as long. John's always been mad at me. I've had yeah, one exchange. Yeah. With him. He's a lefty. He's a hard yeah, left I, lefty. I mean, I mean, his column this this week was insane. You know, saying that, uh, rep- suggesting that Republicans are all secretly uh, hoping that Trump loses. Right, it's that, nuts. Yeah, Politico is so nuts. far gone. But what's yeah, the alternative? It, what does the right need to do? I think what the right needs to do is take a take a pause and basically say, how are we spending our money? Let's. Let's try to focus on building something that does contend and have the kind of research and investigative capacity of a place like ProPublica. It's expensive. It takes time. Um, but there are enough journalists out there, young journalists. I, I mean, I highly recommend him to you. Gabe Kaminsky, one of my former interns who writes uh, for the Washington Examiner. He has done an enormous, great investigative work over the past. He's won a couple of awards for, for it already as a very young guy. Um, and But that's the kind of thing where we need 10 more of those people and we need them working together to unearth all the different stories that we're missing. I love oh, that's Fox. Brilliant. I love working for Fox, but but Fox can't be the only place that sort of is doing anything like this. And to be honest, Fox, you know, it, as much as it's a cable news network, so what's focused on what's happening now, it can't do some of these investigative deep dives that we need to do in order to unravel things like the expensive campaign uh, that is being waged by Sheldon Whitehouse and those uh, and basically a host of Democratic funders to attack the Supreme Court to try well to said. get Clarence Thomas well said. impeached, things like that. Ben, I always enjoy our Fridays. Thank you so much. Go listen to the Ben Dominich podcast. Go follow him on X at Ben at B Dominich and see him on Fox News. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. Globalpost.com. Write it down, put it on your favorites bar, globalpost.com, and then subscribe. It's free if you're a student. It's free if you're a teacher in high school, junior high, or college. But if you just want to get the largest daily newsletter in the world devoted to world news, you go to globalpost.com. I'm joined by its creator and its senior editor, Philip Balboni. Good morning, Philip. How are you? Good morning, Hugh. I'm well. How are you? I'm great. I read with great interest your lead story today, weaponizing migration. And I want people to, I'm going to read just the first three paragraphs. In Senegal, Haiti, India, China, and Libya, the new hot ticket is Nicaragua. Famed for its beaches, volcanoes, and rainforest, citizens of dozens of countries are attracted by a different lure. It's become a major gateway to the United States. Quote, in Senegal, it's all over the streets. Everyone's talking about Nicaragua, Nicaragua, Nicaragua. Gueva Ba, 40 of Dakar, Senegal, told the Associated Press. Why, Philip? Why write about Nicaragua today? Well, we, everyone in America knows we have a huge migration crisis on our southern border, but uh, much, much less well-known is the role that Nicaragua is playing. So, uh, believe it or not, about 10% of all the migrants arriving at the uh, U.S.-Mexico border are coming up from Nicaragua. Now, many of them are Nicaraguans, but a huge number of them now coming from all over the world. And uh, these people are arriving on flights into Managua Airport. That's the capital of Nicaragua. They're coming from Central Asia. They're coming from Africa. They're coming from other parts of the world. They're coming in on human trafficking flights that have really been organized and incentivized by the government of Nicaragua. President Daniel Ortega, who um, is doing this really to um, punish the United States. So people come in uh, and uh, they pay heavy fees to get there. And then they still have to make the trek up north um, through Honduras and into Mexico to get across the border. Uh, But it saves them uh, going through what's called the Darien Gap, people coming from Venezuela up through that uh, little section that goes into Panama and then all the way up. So um, it's an extraordinary problem. And it's also a national security threat because many of these migrants are coming from countries um, like Tajikistan, um, Uzbekistan, Libya, that are highly unstable, that have a lot of jihadist influence. If you were 
the 9-11 hijackers um, in 2024, this would be the route that you would choose to get into the United States. Let me read a further down paragraph in this morning's lead story. Again, go to Global Post. You just, just put it into a, a search engine. But what's the URL, Phil? Is it the Global Post or GlobalPost.com? It's, it's www.globalpost.com. Yep. All right. Glo- GlobalPost.com. Here is the key paragraph. Quote, the numbers tell the story. Between May 2023 and May 2024, more than 1,000 flights with migrants such as Libya, Morocco, Uzbekistan, India, and Tajikistan landed in Managua, while in a six-month period between June and November 2023, 500 flights, mostly from Haiti and Cuba, landed there according to the Inter-American Dialogue. That's astonishing. It's big business, Phil, and I cannot believe the United States is letting it go on. Can we interdict this? I don't think so. I mean, I don't think we we barely have any relations with Nicaragua. Uh, the country is uh, an outright dictatorship from President Ortega in power uh, between his two terms for 28 years. This man goes back to the, uh, the Sandinistas Reagan. of the, uh, yeah. the 80s and 90s and the Iran Contra and all that stuff, President Reagan. Um, so we really don't have uh, any influence there. And um, yeah. He is, now, I have a question, which is, is, which is kind of weird. How come you are covering this at GlobalPost.com? It's the world's largest newsletter on international affairs, and it, you can get, try a two-week free trial if you want. Go to the landing page and get the two-week free trial. And again, it's free. I'll make sure I cover the Global Education Initiative. But how come no one is reporting this? This is a major story. And by the way, our borders are Kamala Harris was supposed to get to the root causes. Well, the root causes turned out to be Managua International Airport. Right, exactly. Why? Because very few people are covering the world anymore. Um, you know, I was listening to your previous segment with uh, with Ben, and about you know um, the state of journalism in the center or the right. Um, the state of journalism in global affairs uh, in covering the world is in tatters, and it has been for more than twenty years. It's just been going down. There are very few people who do it. Um, it's a shame because the world needs to be covered. Americans need to know more about the world. And this is, you know, our whole reason for our existence is to. You know, I, I used Americans to have John Fisher Burns on monthly. John Fisher Burns was maybe the greatest war correspondent of the last 50 years. He's retired now to Oxford or Cambridge in Great Britain. I no longer bother him. But I don't know yeah. that we have a Dexter Filkins or a John Fisher. Brent. I, in fact, I think the Global Post is about it. News items cover some international stuff, but they also have to cover domestic stuff and economic stuff. You're solely focused. GlobalPost.com is solely focused on news of the world. How many people yeah. work for you? I mean, who's putting this together? It's fabulous. I don't know what your team is. Well, uh, we have a relatively small team. It's probably about 20 people. Um, but... Um, you know, we're able to do it by careful research um, and scouring resources, uh, sources, news sources all over the world. And we've expanded the company, too. We now own another publication devoted to, uh, to global affairs. So we're trying to um, play a stronger role in this. And um, I don't know. It's a, it's a great mission, but it's a great question. Why Why isn't more coverage of things like Nicaragua, it's because there's nobody focused on it. And they got to connect A to B to C. They, they, people wonder why do we have more than 10 million people enter the country without permission or invitation in the last four years? And the answer is because the cartels have monetized this and Ortega hates the United States and, and they are able to, and, and of course, underlying economic and persecution conditions feed into this as well. Philip, let's make sure we tell people about the Global Education Initiative, because this is why I started having Philip on once a month. He's not a sponsor. I have him on simply because I want young people to know about the world and they don't have to pay for it. Talk about it a little bit, Philip. Yeah. So if people go to the website, they'll see something uh, in the navigation says Global Education. Um, If you go there, you can read about our free subscriptions for students, high school, college homeschooled, which really, Hugh, I owe to you. Um, uh, We've added a special link just for homeschool students uh, and teachers as well. Um, We love helping young people 
all the information is right there. There's a, a separate way for each category of person. If you're a high school student, there's a link for you. It only takes about a minute or less to sign up. Um, it's entirely free to the student, entirely free to the schools. Um, it's what we love to do. I am begging teachers to assign this on a daily basis, Monday through Friday. If you're teaching social studies or American history, if you read the Global Post every morning and just go through the stories, the kids can do it in real time. It's free. They don't need a, a Chrome either. You could, you can, uh, if you don't allow computers or cell phones in your, in your school, you can print it off, copy it, and pass it around, and Philip's not going to sue you because his goal is to educate people. So what is the growth metric, Philip, for the Global Post? Well, we have almost a million readers now on the web and in our, our newsletters. Um, and in the That's Global Education fabulous. Program, we're now in 79 countries around the world. I mean, literally I... in every corner of our planet. We have young people reading the newsletter um, every day uh, in 1,100 schools, uh, about 10,000 students and teachers. Uh, yeah, if David Muir this, reads this one article, if David Muir, who's next week's debate moderator, if he reads this one article, he'll get a good question. The, the predicate would be the Nicaraguan airport, yeah, and yeah, the, the question yeah. would be, what are you going to do about this? I mean, that would be a perfect know, question. It would be. I know, David, he started at the station I used to uh, run here in Boston, uh, WCBB. He's uh, ah. become a very successful anchor. Yeah. Well, I very, very much hope he reads today's Global Post. Philip Balboni, thank you again. The Global Education, you can't miss it. If you go to globalpost.com, which is on my, on my computer right now, it says about the second thing is Global Education Initiative. If you're a teacher yeah. or if you're a high school student or a junior high school student, go sign up, get it for free. And follow P. Balboni on X if you want to know what Philip is up to as well. Thank you, Philip. Have a good month. It's going to be a wild one. And I Thank hope you. they read it before Tuesday night. Uh, let me remind Thank everyone you, out you, there you. that um, General Ishimo is covering today on Dwayne's World all of the New York Trump speech. If you missed the first hour of the program today, I covered as much of the Trump Economic New York Club as I could. But I do want you very much to to go and listen to all of it, because I think it's, it's critical to the future of America. Sarah, I thought we were into the dead zone, you know, the Bermuda Triangle of legislation, but apparently there's life in the House and Senate yet. That's right. We've got the big spending fight coming up, and Republicans are picking what I think could end up being a really interesting battle over the, the SAVE Act, which is this piece of legislation that's going to be, if House Republicans get their way, tied into a short-term spending bill that would make it e even more illegal for uh, undocumented immigrants to vote in elections, uh, create enforcement mechanisms there. That's going to prove polarizing for Democrats who say, you know, that's already illegal. We don't need a law. It's not a problem. But it's a really, really popular measure. Uh, among all Republicans, the donor class, the centrist Republicans, the conservative Republicans. So I think it could end up being a really interesting battle. So uh, they want to attach a CR that gets us through to March, right? I think it's spending through March, but attached to it is heightened enforcement and penalties for anyone in the country without invitation and permission, anyone in the country who's not a citizen attempting to vote. Are Democrats really going to vote against that? Well, it's come up before and only five House Democrats joined with Republicans to vote to pass it. But Republicans do have the votes to get it through the House. What will be really interesting is what would happen in the Senate if Schumer was forced to contend with this, because you have vulnerable Democratic senators like John Tester and like Sherrod Brown, who would probably really seriously consider voting for this. It would be... Uh, an easy political ad for their opponents to cut to say, look, here is a Democratic senator who professes to be a centrist, professes to be standing up for you, and has voted to allow illegal immigrants to vote in our elections. So because of that, and because this is the CR, so this could be done through reconciliation, they don't need to meet that 60 vote threshold. They would only need 51 votes to pass this. I think Schumer would have a hard time keeping this from going through, and it would just rhetorically 
from a messaging standpoint, be really difficult for Democratic leadership to argue against this kind of bill. I think of the I think of Tim Kaine in Virginia should be comfortably ahead. Hung Kyle's getting closer. Dave McCormick is tied with Senator Casey. Uh, Martin Heinrich is the senator in New Mexico, and Nella Domenici is catching up. We have a new affiliate down there in Clovis, so I want to bring that up. We've got, of course, Sherrod Brown. You mentioned Bernie Marino's caught him, and I think is going to beat him. There, it's all across. There are eleven vulnerable Democrats. Eleven in Michigan where uh, an unknown congresswoman is running against Mike Rogers, who's better known than she is, I can't imagine the Michigan senators voting no on this and screwing their own nominated report uh, to replace the senator there. Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, Schumer would obviously rather not have to have this come to the floor. Uh, This is not something that Democrats want to be talking about. They don't want the conversation to be about the fact that between eight and 10 million illegal immigrants have come into this country under uh, the Biden-Harris administration, and that there are not really a lot of safeguards in some of these states to prevent illegal immigrants from voting. You're seeing a really contentious lawsuit play out right now in Arizona over whether proof of citizenship is required uh, to register to vote. And the Biden administration, Democrats are fighting really hard against proof of citizenship requirements for voter registration. So Republicans- Can you imagine Ruben Gallego voting against this in the House? He's going to have to either miss the vote or vote against it because he's a radical. And if he does, Kerry Lake is going to have that ad running from now until Election Day. Yeah, it puts Democrats in a really terrible position because this isn't one of those issues where, you know, the country is split 50-50. This is more like a 90-10 issue. Most Americans overwhelmingly support the idea that undocumented immigrants shouldn't vote in elections. They feel the same way about voter ID laws. People should have to show an ID. These are just generally popular ideas beyond the fact that there are some of the few things that can unite the very fractured GOP conference under Speaker Mike Johnson. So I think this is actually a pretty smart fight for Johnson to be picking because it could suggest he has the power to unite his conference after striking out a few times this year on that front. Now, a quick quick exit question. Mike Johnson's really surprised me because I didn't know anything about him. He's become a great speaker. Uh, and Kevin McCarthy, big shoes to fill. What is Kevin McCarthy's role with the GOP caucus still? Is he still whispering in the ear and giving guidance? Well, you know, sometimes it seems like he just pops up to be a, sort of flame the fans of drama. I mean, we saw that at the RNC around some some side comments around Matt Gates. But I do think that Kevin McCarthy has done a good job of sort of fading into the background, at least from a public relations standpoint, and letting Mike Johnson take center stage. He's not hovering in the background like Pelosi has, for example, over Hakeem Jeffries. Johnson has the, all the forward facing trappings of being the real speaker. I wasn't gonna. I wasn't gonna put words in your mouth, but that is what strikes me: is McCarthy maybe helping with money and donors, but he's not running the party, and we know it's not a King Jeffries. We know it's Nancy Pelosi. <laughs>